from Acton Town to Wimbledon, from Brixton to beyond. Come love your London with us and sing with us this song. There's no more smog but we've a vlog to brighten up your day. Come love your London with us from Q to Haringey. Come out with us and play. Love your London. Have a banana. In today's episode of Love Your London, we start off in Barnes, an area of London with a rich musical history. We'll be talking about pop stars, rock stars, tunnelling engineers, evil murderesses, rugby history, football history and a very special old tree. But, as always, we start off at the station. Welcome to Barnes to Mortlake. It's a brand new series and uh, we're starting off uh, in Barnes. Lovely leafy Barnes. It's a real little village. I can't wait to tell you all about it. It's a brand new series, Barnes to Mortlake. And, and we're in the London borough of Richmond now. We're going to be seeing so much in this, in this series, uh, including the wonderful Wetland Centre. Uh, which, will, which will be in the next episode. Uh, but um, but uh, in this episode we're going to be talking quite a lot. We're going to start off talking about this wonderful station. Okay, so this uh, station is in Zone 3 and uh, it's Grade 2 listed, uh, designed by John Thomas Emmett in the Tudor Gothic style. Um, it's, uh, it's a lovely station. You can see we're surrounded by beautiful trees. Um, unfortunately, there's no toilets. Um, but it is sort of accessible. Funny enough, these platforms aren't accessible. That's platform two and platform three. They're not accessible. Platform four and platform one are accessible. But look, we, we've we've turned up on platforms two and three, so it's sort of semi semi accessible. But they're fixing that. They're going to make these platforms accessible very 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 soon. And I think it may even be they're starting to work on it this year. So yay! Well done. They're learning. They're going to be creating an accessible footbridge which will allow wheelchairs to be able to go to platforms two and three. That's really good because it's quite confusing. Platform one over there, as I said, is accessible. So the services that, are, that arrive there on platform one on a Sunday turn up on platform two, uh, which means that um, pe people in wheelchairs have to remember that um, a service that normally they can, they can, they, that is accessible for them that arrives on platform one during the week is at the moment not accessible for them on a Sunday. So it's all very confusing. So it's really good that they're going to make this whole uh, station accessible. Now, sadly, the station is also the site of a major crash that happened in 1955. It was sadly caused by human error. Um, a signalman uh, didn't, or had forgotten that there was going to be a freight train coming through at the, at the time. So he failed to use his release key to clear the signals. 13 people died, 41 were injured. Unfortunately, one of the people who died was Bernard Crouch, one of this country's most important and probably best at the time table tennis players. So absolutely uh, tragic. Um, but anyway, as I said, the 14 people in all uh, lost their lives at this awful crash. Um, it's not the only crash that's happened around here. I'm going to explain a little bit more about that later. But that's, that one is not a rail-related crash. It's a car-related crash. So no one actually knows where the name Barnes comes from. Um, it, um, it's quite an old name because it, beca it appears in the Doomsday Book in 1086 as Burn, B-E-R-N-E. -E. Uh, so it's definitely a very old name, but no one's actually sure exactly the origins of the name Barnes. Yeah, so, um, so th that's the Grade 2 listed building. Um, it's, um, the funny thing about it is, um, is that, and this is quite unusual, um, this building here, uh, and the ticket office over there are privately owned. That's uh, very unusual on the on the public uh, network that to actually uh, have privately owned buildings that are used for the ticket office and this building here, which is the station building itself. Uh, so um, very interesting that. Okay, so we were talking uh, just now about a crash that happened uh, in the station. However. Uh, however, we, we, uh, we were, there was another crash, as I said, that happened here involving a car and involving who is, well, I believe the best male voice that this country has ever produced in the, in the world of popular music. And that, that man 
is, uh, is Mark Bolan of uh, T-Rex. Um, tragic, a tragic, tragic accident that happened. Took him from, from this world uh, in 1977, so young. He was the person who started the whole glam rock movement. Um, now he couldn't drive, uh, so it was his girlfriend, Gloria Jones. Um, I'm sure you remember Gloria Jones. She's still alive to this day, thank goodness. She's the queen of Northern Soul. She did uh, that famous song, Tainted Love, you know? Tainted Love, uh, which obviously you, you, I mean, you probably obviously will, will know the soft cell version of it, but it was originally a beautiful Northern Soul song written by, uh, sung by uh, Gloria Jones. Uh, she was driving the car. They'd both had uh, something to drink, but as I said, um, Mark couldn't drive. Sorry, Mark didn't know how to drive, so Gloria is the one who took them in their little mini. Um, and they came over, for, over there from the east, heading west, uh, over that bridge in her mini. She, they hit um, a fence that was reinforced with, uh, with steel. Um, and uh, just as they came over the f fence, and then they hit the sycamore tree over there. And ever since then, there has been this shrine to Mark Bolan. We're going to go and have a look at this amazing shrine. Uh, it's, up, it's maintained by the TAG Group, that's the T-Rex Appreciation Group, which is run by Fee Warner. Anyhow, um, as you can see, you see there the white swan, or oh, this one, <coughs> one down there. Oh, <sighs> put that up there where it belongs. That's because he he uh, he. Um, he wrote a song, of course, Ride a White Swan, which is why there's uh, white swans here. So look at these, look at these amazing, uh, amazing things here. Um, your music will live with me forever. Kel me from Liz Marston. I mean, you know what? these are just beautiful, heartfelt. Oh, look at them, they look lovely. Oh, and this smile. Oh. Uh, so fans uh, originally thought that it was the tree, the sycamore tree, that had killed him uh, when they'd uh, come across from the east in the purple mini. Uh, but actually, I mean, I mean they, they, you know, they took their anger out on the tree, they even pulled one of the branches down. Uh, but actually, uh, the tree saved, well, certainly saved Gloria Jones uh, from, from probably dying, because in fact, uh, I mean, Gloria J Jones sustained horrific injuries. She broke her jaw, she broke her uh, arm as well, I believe. Uh, but the, uh, the tree is actually what stopped the car from, from careering down into the embankment down there, where almost certainly they both would have died. Uh, we know this. Well, there was someone who was following them behind in the car and, and saw exactly uh, what happened. But also we know this because the uh, damage uh, caused to the tree was far too high up for it to have been caused by the Mini, which means that the Mini was carrying with it this, uh, this fence with the big bolt in it. And the reason why it had that is because, in fact, the, the fence is quite gruesome. There was, an, there was a big eye bolt in the fence itself, uh, which actually, um, ironically, went through Mark Boland's eye and into his brain. Uh, and uh, that's, what, that's what killed, it killed him. He died instantly. Um, but uh, we know that, in fact, that it was, in fact, the, the, the fence and not the tree that actually ca caused his death. Anyways, it's quite moving. Um, he's actually he's actually not buried here, or the ashes aren't scattered here. His ashes are actually um, buried underneath a rose bush at Golders Green Crematorium, um, where my grandfather um, is also uh, buried, as is um, as is Amy Winehouse. So Mark Bolin is in very good company. Um, the T Rex Action Group is um, is is maintained uh, via donations and it's run by Fee Warner. Um, she actually bought this area from the council to ensure that the council never removes the tree and, that, and they maintain the shrine via donations. If you would like to donate on your screen now, there is a QR code where you can donate via PayPal uh, to the action group. Uh, there is a very interesting and quite spooky fact um, here, by the way. Um, I don't know if you believe in these sort of things, but it's really, really spooky. Um, one of the lyrics of T-Rex's songs, uh, back from 1972, so five years before he died, um, I'm going to read here. Uh, this is, this um, comes from uh, Solid Gold Easy Action. 
Um, and um, it rather spookily goes, easy as picking foxes from a tree. Now, the number plate of uh, Gloria's Mini was Fox 6611, FOX 6611. And of course it hit the tree. So very, very odd, very spooky that in that lyric, She's, uh, he, he sings, easy as picking foxes from a tree. And that's not all. In that same song, you also have the, the line, woman from the east with her headlights shining. And of course, as I said, they came from the east over that bridge um, at night because they'd just been drinking in Mayfair. Um, I, I, I assume with the, with the headlights shining, hit the tree, the, the mini with the fox number plate. It's quite spooky uh, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, there you go. Now, um, Mark Bolan has a very, very special place in my heart. In fact, his song, Get It On, was number one on my birthday. Um, so, Get It On. I, I, I actually love it. I, I've actually uh, own a, a disc. Um, it, it cost me quite a bit at the time. Um, I, own, I, own, I own a disc uh, which, which like, uh, remembers him and uh, it's very, very moving. So we're now going to do a special tribute here. Um, we've prepared something. We're going to place uh, here on this barrel um, a, a little thing to show our appreciation for, for Mark Bolan. Um, and as we do that, I'm going to read you, um, I'm going to read you some lines. Well, you're dirty and sweet. Clad in black, don't look back, and I love you. You're dirty and sweet, oh yeah. Well, you're slim and weak. You've got the teeth of the Hydra upon you. You're dirty and sweet, and you're my girl. Get it on. Bang a gong, get it on. Get it on. Bang a gong, get it on. Okay, so that over there is Roslyn Park FC. It's actually, you know, Roslyn Park Football Club, but it's actually a rugby club. Uh, but it's called Roslyn Park FC. I'm going to explain a little bit more, more now about that. It's in the National League One, which is in the third tier of the rugby structure. And uh, one of the most notorious members and players here um, is, is the actor Oliver Reed. Uh, Rest in peace. Uh, he um, he actually paid for the floodlights. Not these floodlights. They got damaged in a storm. But uh, the previous floodlights, he actually uh, he actually paid for them. Um, and uh, behind the rugby club is a very exclusive Roehampton club, which comprises of some 28 tennis courts, six squash courts, and an 18-hole golf club. You can see this from uh, Google Earth um, at the moment on your screen. Now that's a private members club. You have to be proposed and seconded to join the waiting list and you can only actually join it depending on how many people have died or resigned the previous year. There's a hundred acres altogether and uh, just on the other side of the golf club on Priory Lane, you can't see it from here but it's, uh, it's right over and uh, you get named after Priory Lane of course, the Priory. A very, very famous, uh, I mean the Priory for, for our American viewers, uh, it's, it's our equivalent of the Betty Ford Clinic. Uh, it is a place that uh, deals with mental, mental, uh, mental health issues, uh, particularly addiction. Um, and uh, there's a, I mean, so many famous celebrities have, have gone there. So like, you know, normally after they've been discovered by the press doing something naughty, they check themselves into the Priory. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna check my notes here. Just a small small amount of people who've been here: Eric Clapton, Pete Doherty, George Best, Amy Winehouse, of course, Sinead O'Connor, Robbie Williams, Amy Winehouse. I've mentioned already. Robbie Williams, uh, Paula Yates. They've all been treated there. Now, Paula Yates, come come, come with me one moment. So um, yeah, Paula Yates. Um, we, we're just um, yeah. uh, we're just like three minutes walk from. Um, from, from where I was, we were just now, just talking about uh, about the Priory. Um, Paula Yates, of course, uh, her first uh, husband was uh, Bob Geldof. Um, and uh, when they married, the best man was Simon Le Bon, who happens to live here. 
Number 397, uh, he's, uh, he lives here. Um, it's, um, we, we don't really want to invade, invade his privacy, um, but it is, it is common knowledge that he lives here. Um, it's on loads and loads of websites. In fact, you can go to company's house and type in Simon Le Bon and this address comes up. So he's not sort of hiding, he's not precious about where he lives. Um, and he's got plenty of money anyway, wish we had plenty of money. Um, you know, you can become a patron if you want. That, I mean, like, you know, the odd like two or three pounds a month helps. Um, and if you don't want to give us money, then uh, you can help us for free by... by um, give us your time. Yes, give us, give us your time, share our videos, put loads of stuff in the comments because YouTube algorithms like that. Um, and like this video as well. Um, and uh, and but just share it on your social media and you know what to do. That will really help. I mean... We could search his bins and look for something and put it on eBay. I mean, that, that, you know, that's, that would be really bad. We can't do that. We don't do we that. We don't do that. No, so, don't. So, so because we don't do that, we need, and we're such honest and lovely people, we just need, we just need your help. Um, but even if you just help us by sharing these videos, that's, that's good enough. Anyway, let's go on to the next place. This road here is actually called Putney Park Lane. Putney Park Lane, but next to it, there's another road called Putney Park Lane. There are in fact two, two lanes next to one another, both called Putney Park Lane. And here it is. So two, you got this lane here, and then that one over there. They're both called Putney Park Lane. So this house is on Putney Park Lane, and so is that one, even though they're, they're two different streets. This here is the lodge. Um, this is the North Lodge. There's another lodge uh, to the south called the South Lodge, funnily enough. This current road is from the 18th century. Um, and the entrance lodge is original. Um, but the lane itself dates almost certainly from medieval times. Uh, this whole area used to be a deer park called Putney Park, and there is written evidence of this uh, being here uh, dating right back to the 1200s, the 13th century. And now we're not going to really be covering Putney in this series. We're, the only parts of Putney that we're going to be covering are the ones that are really close to the barns. Um, so we're not going to go down there because we'll be saving all that for when we get to do, get to pee for Putney. I'm sorry, it's going to be a bit of a long wait. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this, this, this charming road here. So it's a really good place for, for animals as well, for wildlife. Okay, yes, it's absolutely crazy how many famous musicians, past and present, live in this area. This is number six, Briar's Walk. And here lives none other than John Deacon. John Deacon from Queen, again. Uh, don't want to disturb him, it's his private residence. Um, but again, it's common knowledge, it's on all over the internet, and um, again, it's on Company's House if you want to check it to check, uh, for yourself. But yes, he lives here, number, uh, number, uh, number six. Um, and in fact, all uh, of the, um, all of the members of Queen have at some point lived in this area. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about them uh, when we go there, but uh, he, he's the only one who currently is still living in this area. Uh, but as I said, they all have lived in this area. Um, but yeah, let's head now back up towards uh, the north side of the tracks. We're going to go up Dyer's Lane, uh, cross over the tracks and see what is on the other side. There's a blue plaque to show you. Okay, so uh, we're actually on one of the many private roads around here. Uh, this is uh, St Mary's Grove. And this here is number three, and we see a blue plaque. And what that means is that someone very important used to live here. There it is. James Henry Greathead, railway and travelling engineer. He only lived here from 1885 till 1889, so not very long, um, but it is the only blue plaque that he has. You are in fact only allowed to have one blue plaque um, per, uh, per person. Uh, he was originally from South Africa, 
and he invented the Great Head Shield, which, among other things, was used for tunnelling soft earth. He made tunnels all over the place. Uh, he, in fact, um, was the very first person to say that uh, he should, uh, they should build a tunnel under the Thames to connect uh, uh, Britain with France. Um, and he also thought that uh, he, they, could, they should maybe do one under the Irish Sea as well, uh, to link um, Ireland and, and Wales, I suppose. Yes, it would have been Wales, I, I imagine. Uh, but um, yes, yeah, so, so absolutely uh, very, very, very intelligent uh, engineer. Um, in his inventions were, well, they revolutionised the whole underground system because his uh, shield was used to, to build lots of those original tunnels uh, through the soft earth. It was, a, it was, a, it was a very, especially for soft earth. He was known as the Tunnel Man. Um, Another one he done, another one he did, uh, quite close to where uh, we live, is the Blackpool Tunnel. Uh, that's one of his, one of his uh, jobs. Uh, he also did the second tunnel uh, under the Thames. That's the Tower Subway uh, Tunnel, which goes from Tower of London underneath. Um, not many people know about that one, um, but we're going to talk about that when we when we when we cover the Tower of London area. Probably quite a wait for that, but we might sort of cover it when we do our City of London um, episodes, which won't be too long to wait. Uh, but yes, he he did this tunnel which is quite a fascinating story about that particular tunnel. That was the second tunnel under the Thames that uh, he did. And uh, it's really thanks to him that we actually call the London Underground Network the Tube. Because that was, uh, that was, a, that was a term that sort of like came about uh, at the time. He was, was building and making all these tubes underneath London. He's, he's using his, his special shield, his magic shield. Anyway, so... Um, we're now going to a very interesting and spooky place. It could even be haunted, they say. It's Barnes Cemetery. Uh, and uh, so you're in for a real treat. It's not easy to find, but it's worth it when you do. Okay, so here we are. Uh, we are in the abandoned Barnes Cemetery. Um, as you can see, I mean, it's just absolutely fabulous. All these overgrown, um, all these overgrown, uh, Graves. Now, in fact, in 1966, the Council of the London Borough of Richmond bought the cemetery from the Church of England to turn it into a grass-covered area, believe it or not. They were going to remove all the trees and all the memorials, and instead they were just going to have uh, these little plaques on the ground just to show where each memorial was. So disrespectful and so unnecessary, but they just thought, oh, let's do that. It's the 60s, don't care about history so much. Um, they demolished the chapel and they demolished the lodge and the railings, which is why we just managed to walk straight into here. Um, but fortunately, they ran out of money and so they never did what they were going to do. They just abandoned it. Um, and that has meant that this remains as a sort of a time capsule. And it's very fortunate for us now as it's two acres of absolute beauty. As you can see, it's quite overgrown. And, not uh, as overgrown as Nunhead. Not as overgrown as Nunhead, but it's quite spooky at night. Um, oh. So they say, I've not actually been here at night, only in the daytime time um, but if you do believe in ghosts I'm I, I don't I'm afraid but if you do believe in ghosts then um, this no, is you're not afraid yeah I am afraid of no ghost anyway so uh, so uh, it's um, it, then it is reported to be haunted I'm gonna explain a bit about a little bit about that now now somewhere buried here uh, we don't know exactly where is the grave of Julia Martha Thomas so Julia Martha Thomas, she was a lady, twice widowed, and she lived on her own in Richmond. Uh, she wasn't particularly wealthy. Um, in fact, she was probably categorised as lower middle class. But she put on she put on lots of airs and graces, and she uh, and 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 she dressed smartly. She didn't really need a maid. Um, she only really had a maid just to put on these airs and graces um, and just to sort of show off, you know, oh, I have a maid. Um, uh, and, uh, so, uh, but she was such a horrible person to, to work for that the, the maids barely lasted uh, any time with her at all. Um, so yeah, That's how people are today. Oh, she was horrible to them. She would like, make people um, scrub, just after they scrubbed, make them scrub again, even though it's completely clean. Yeah. Loads of people complained. And, but anyway, so she was getting through maids quite quickly. Anyhow, in, in 1879, she took on as a maid a lady called Kate Webb who had come from County Wexford in Ireland. Um, now she had already been in and out of prison quite a few times and her husband and her children um, had all died mysteriously within a short period of time. Uh, so she served prison time for larceny. Uh, what uh, could possibly go wrong? Yeah, she, she, she served prison time for larceny, which uh, which is um, 
basically uh, theft, uh, another word for theft, um, in, in Ireland. And then she moved to Liverpool in England, where she fell again into the wrong crowd and ended up uh, imprisoned for larceny again. This, and, and believe it or not, she's 19 at this, t at this time. She'd already had kids and, and, and been uh, in prison in Ireland, and here she is in prison again in Liverpool. Anyway. Uh, when she got out, she moved to London, and after more children from different partners and even more prison time, including a stint at Wandsworth Prison, she eventually became Mrs Thomas's maid. Uh, she was about 29 at that time when she became her maid, uh, but they obviously did not get on at all. Uh, Thomas was apparently horrible to her and eventually sacked her on the 28th of February, just after a few weeks. This is... Um, this is 1879. Kate Webster persuaded Mrs Thomas to give her three more days so that she could sort herself out, which she agreed to. But that night there was a, a real argument which ended up with Webster throwing her from the top of the stairs to the bottom floor and then strangling her to death. Um, Kate then cut off her head with a razor, cut the body into little bits and boiled them in the laundry copper and she'd answer the door to visit she put she put on mrs thomas's clothes and she'd answer they should make the door you. oh well yes actually it should there is i think uh, something anyway she um she'd put she'd um she put on uh, mrs thomas's clothes and uh pretend to be her whenever there'd be deliveries coming to the door um uh, mrs thomas would actually go away for long periods of time so initially people weren't that suspicious so she'd pretend that her name was Mrs Thomas. Uh, she couldn't fit her, um, the head or one of uh, Mrs Thomas's feet into the bag, but she disposed of the body parts in the Thames where they were soon discovered. Um, now, uh, she went around to the neighbours and to the local pub, uh, it's called the Hole in the Wall, uh, it's long gone now. Go, she'd go around to the neighbours and uh, this, is, this is actually uh, hearsay but it's probably almost only happened because a lot of people have, have mentioned it. She went around to the local neighbours and the pub um, selling special dripping uh, which she had made yes. from boiling all this flesh for so long uh, before she, yes. she, and she was selling it around the, around the pub. Uh, they, I don't think anyone took it, but she's offering it to children to the, and to neighbours. Yeah, yeah. Special beef dripping, the best you can get. She, she then tried to sell uh, Mrs Thomas's um, furniture. Uh, she sold quite a lot of it to the local pub, the hole in the wall, um, and the removal people coming to remove the stuff and, uh, and the neighbours getting really suspicious. And they actually asked the removal guys, uh, you know, well, what's all this about? Well, she's, where she's moving to? And they said, oh no, it's Mrs Thomas. Uh, she's, uh, they're moving all the stuff out. And uh, so the neighbours said, well, who, who's, where's Mrs Thomas? And they said, well, that, that lady over there. And they said, that's not, that's not Mrs Thomas, that's Kate. That's the maid. So they, they put two and two together. Kate went on the run. Uh, she'd uh, already, I think, been paid for all the stuff, uh, all the furniture uh, from um, the Hole in the Wall publican. She went on the run, went to Ireland, um, hid there, I think, with her, with her uncle. Uh, but the police, uh, who had obviously found all this, this, all these, uh, this bag of, of um, and a crate full of body parts, um, uh, and, 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 and they'd put two and two together quite quickly that, that obviously uh, this was probably uh, the remains of Mrs Thomas and they found out that in fact uh, Kate had been wanted in Ireland for larceny and in Liverpool as well so they realised that she'd probably gone to Ireland and they found her and they brought her back to England and it was an extremely public case I mean she was a, uh, it, was in, it was a real media sensation it was in all the papers in, in England and in Ireland it was a huge case huge public interest when the court case happened King Gustav V of Sweden uh, although then he was the crown prince uh, he, he came to, to look at the, to watch the court case because it was so exciting and so interesting salacious, anyway salacious. it was salacious and anyway so she was found um, she was found obviously she, she actually confessed to it uh, she was found guilty uh, she was executed by hanging um, and um, and so many people wanted well I mean the next day after she was executed uh, they, they auctioned off uh, all the property that was in the house um, 
actually the the publican of the of the uh, of the uh, hole in the wall uh, who had bought a lot of the furniture and stuff he he they, he managed to argue his case that he had, had he'd actually bought this stuff in good faith so he managed to take away quite a lot of the things including the uh, knife and the razor that um, that uh, Kate had, had cut the body up with um, the copper bow the copper um, the laundry copper in which he had boiled all the bones that went for that that everyone wanted that that went for five shillings in the Ooh, end which was a lot bar. Of, hipster that was, bar. absolutely yes it would be in a hipster bar <laughs> it would be in a bar now but anyway, it, was, it was just gruesome and everyone wanted that wanted a bid for that one so but, but basically when there was nothing left for people to buy uh, the, the members of the public went into the garden and picked up even stones and pebbles to for keepsakes because they wanted to have a a, me a memory of this uh, of this amazing thing um, in, so many people wanted to see what kate looked like that madame tussauds uh, did a wax effigy of her um of course for people did. to look at um the house is actually still there to this day i believe it's number two mayfield cottages it wasn't torn down like a like a lot of these murder houses are in fact people said i can't believe this is a murder house it's a lovely little cottage but it's actually off Park Road in Richmond. Um, Mrs. Thomas's body parts, that's at least the bits of her that they found in the bag, um, minus, uh, minus her head and her foot, um, are buried somewhere in this cemetery. Uh, no one actually knows why because she, she was not a um, she was not a, a rich person, as I said. She only pretended to be rich, so she was probably given a pauper's, um, a pauper's grave. Uh, there's no record exactly where she is, but she is buried here. Um, and there is a there is a, a, a rumor, and it's obviously apocryphal because no one knows where she was buried. But there is a rumor that over her grave there is the a ghost of a nun who floats around at night above it. Uh, but actually, uh, because no one actually knows where she was buried, it's, it must be a load of rubbish. But there you go. It's, a, it's still a, a fun story to tell the grandkids, oh, isn't it? Is Scare them. Fun place to hang out. Look at it. But so what happened to her head? Well, in 1952, Sir David Attenborough and his wife Jane bought the house between Mayfield Cottages and the Hole in the Wall pub and uh, after the pub closed down in 2007 uh, David Attenborough did I say David Attenborough or Richard Attenborough? David Attenborough. Yeah good. Yep. Yeah. Um, well in, in, well in 1952 Sir David Attenborough still no uh, in 1952 Sir David Attenborough and his wife Jane Okay, so I'll, okay. Um, so after the pub closed, okay, I'll start this again. So what happened to her head? Well, in 1952, um, Sir David Attenborough and his wife Jane bought the house between Mayfield Cottages and the Hole in the Wall pub. And after the pub closed down uh, in 2007, well, it was called something else in the meantime, uh, David Attenborough bought the pub in 2009 to get it redeveloped. And the workmen in the garden found the skull while they were developing it. Oh, wow. And they, they, they everyone assumed that it was probably uh, the, the head of Mrs. Thomas. I don't think they found the foot. Um, but of course they, they, they couldn't do DNA testing because um, they didn't know where the body parts were buried so they couldn't actually uh, compare the two. But, um, when, but they obviously looked at the skull and, uh, and they, they did a carbon dating of the, of the uh, earth around it and it fitted in perfectly with the time. Obviously, uh, we know that um, she actually went to the hole in the wall the night before the, 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 the bag was found in the Thames. She went with a friend. Um, and, um, and we all know that the hole in the wall publican was uh, in cahoots potentially with, um, with Kate. Um, and when they looked at the skull, they realised that there was hardly any collagen in it. So that's... Uh, that meant that it was definitely boiled for a long time so yep yeah, it's almost certainly that that is the the skull of um of of mrs thomas there was also a, a damage to the skull which show which uh, would be uh, would correlate with the fact that she had been thrown down the stairs um, and the fact that the publican um, had gone to got, would, had like made sure that he got hold of the knife as well um, in the auction as well as the furniture that he'd um, he had bought uh, presumably in good faith yeah it was almost certainly um, probably you know that the, the publican almost certainly knew all about it and probably even helped bury um, the head for her um, but uh, I mean it, as I said it, we don't know where she was buried it could be a pauper's grave uh, no one knows where it is uh, there could be a tombstone in here I mean this place is so overgrown uh, there aren't really any records it could be something here a marker but no one's found it and it's not needed anyway but now let's have a little look at this place over here my song last song it's got lovely and sunny again over here is a very interesting 
a tomb for a very important person, Ebenezer Cobb Morley. Ebenezer Cobb Morley died 20th of November 1924, aged 93. Um, he was a lawyer and he lived in Barnes from 1858 onwards and he founded Barnes Football Club in 1862 and was captain until 1867. Um, the first game was a victory against Richmond FC but back then there were no rules about football. Now if you remember earlier on in this episode we were at uh, Roslyn Park FC which in spite of being called a football club was uh, is in fact a rugby club. Um, so Barnes actually played sort of proper football as we know it today, association football. Um, with their feet rather than picking them up and and all that sort of stuff but back in those days before proper rules um the um it was really up to the uh, the team that was hosting uh the visiting team to decide what rules they were going to play were they going to be playing what we know today as rugby or were they going to be play what we know as association football um it was absolutely absolutely crazy i mean this is in his early days of football before there were proper rules set in place so later that month in december 1862 um, barnes fc played blackheath fc and blackheath insisted that they play a rugby style game and to this day blackheath fc and like Roslyn park is a rugby team um, anyway so um Barnes FC, or who, who weren't really, who didn't really like to play the rugby rules, uh, they lost 2-0 and Morley himself was nearly garroted. Now those aren't my words, they're the words of Sporting Life that did a write-up of the game on the 24th of December 1862. Now you see, back in then, the, uh, it, was, it was such a mess. I mean, the rugby, obviously you could pick the ball up with your hands, you could kick people in the shins, that was known as hacking. None of this was in the rules that old Ebenezer Cobb Morley wanted to play. In 1863, the following year, he set up the, what we, what we know is it well, was, he set up the FA, the Football Association, to try and work out the best rules for football. And so you had all the clubs there, the ones that play association football and the ones that play rugby, although they all call themselves um, FC. Um, and, um, and of course they wouldn't agree. Uh, in fact there was a majority of clubs that wanted to play rugby style, um, uh, which obviously was uh, infuriated uh, old Ebenezer. But then in another meet meeting, Morley um, succeeded in bringing the set of rules from Cambridge University's own version of football, which banned picking up the ball and kicking players in the shins. And the FA ended up deciding to put it on a vote on the 1st of December 1863. But the pro-hacking and the picking up the ball teams refused to attend this in protest. So, because they weren't there to vote against it, the rules for football, and for all kinds of football, officially changed from there on in to play what we know today as football, as association football. Um, Morley was made secretary of the FA and he played in the very first game under the new rules which was a nil-nil draw against Richmond FC. In fact, uh, Richmond FC actually now play rugby, funnily enough. Morley then became president of the FA and he presented the very first FA Cup in 1872, which was won by Wanderers, which had started life in 1859 as Forest FC in Leytonstone. But because they kept moving around London, they became known as Wanderers. That was their nickname and that, that stood and they won it uh, a number of times, the, the FA Cup. Um, now obviously rugby then branched out into its own game, but that's another story for another day. Now, um, Ebenezer was also a keen rower. He rowed right up until his 80s and he participated in the Barnes and Mortlake Regatta in 1858. Um, and he was associated with the London Rowing Club, uh, which is just uh, quite a bit, a bit sort of like towards the southeast of where we are now, uh, going towards Putney. He was the treasurer of that and then he became the secretary, but he also rowed with them. Um, in 1864, he was one of the eight to represent the London Rowing Club at the Grand Challenge Cup at Henley. Okay, so we're now just going to head this way and check out another little wooded area called Smoky Wood. Really lovely place, not many people know about it. Just this way, uh, do, keep, do uh, follow us and uh, discover more.
Now, as you can probably tell, this is not an official blue plaque, but it certainly ought to be. This is a protest plaque, organised by Blue Plaque Rebellion, set up by author Anna Kessel, to highlight the woeful recognition of sportswomen from the past compared to men. Did you know that there are just two statues of named sportswomen in the UK versus almost 200 of sportsmen? Check out the website Women's Sport Trust com for more details. The link is also in the YouTube description. But what is all this about? Well, the Ranala Club, founded in 1878, was a polo club that used to be here, and that year it was the very first ever sports tournament to be hosted under floodlights. It went on to become the largest polo club in the world. But what's all this about Britain's first women's motor race? Well, hardly anyone knows about this, which is outrageous. But on the 14th of July 1900, while a polo match was being played, there took part the first ever ladies' motor car race in 1900. It was won by Miss Weblin on a Daimler, though we only have a photo of Mrs Mary Kennard, who came second on her de Dion Bouton Voiturette. This is a major achievement that deserves far greater recognition. Hashtag recognize her. Barn Elms Sports Centre today is a massive modern complex and it is here where Barnes RFC, which stands for Rugby Football Club, still play. Founded in the 1920s, they claim that they are the continuation of the 1862 club that we spoke about earlier that was founded by Ebenezer Cobb Morley. However, considering that Barnes FC is still around today and still plays association football, that club surely has a bigger claim to being the true inheritor. While their senior club currently play in Chiswick on the other side of the river, their youth team still play here at Barn Elms. Oh, and by the way, that athletics track that you see on your screen now used to be a lake, would you believe it? This sports centre is not only incredibly important for the history of women's sports, but also for the history of gay sports. This is the original home of Stonewall FC, who now play in Stratford. Stonewall FC were founded in 1991 by a group of gay footballers and are Britain's top-ranked LGBTQ plus oriented football team, and they now compete in the English non-league football pyramid. And Love Your London would like now to pay tribute to a wonderful friend, Liam Jarnicky, who was a former player and was a chairman of Stonewall FC for many years, who passed away this summer. A subscriber to this channel, a dear friend, and some of you may remember him when Love Your London interviewed him for our Eurovision special in 2021. Our thoughts go out to his wonderful husband, Sydney. But now, accompany us as we introduce you to Barney, a very special tree. OK, so we are now going inside. This is the only way in, as far as I'm aware. We're now going inside Smoky Wood. What a lovely name. This is a very small little wood. Hardly anyone knows about it because it's so hard to find. You have to be on the right-hand side of the athletics pitch um, and you go through this little gate, Smoky Wood. And it's got a very special tree in there. Now this, this wood, This wood used to be part of the garden of Sir Henry Hoare, the very famous banker of the 1700s, known as Henry the Magnificent. We certainly had a magnificent garden, but we're not just here to look at the garden, we're here to see one of London's great trees. Now, if you remember when we, we were doing our episodes on Barking and Dagenham, we went to Valence Park, where we had a, a brief look at the massive big holm oak there, which um, was one of the London great trees. There are 61 great London trees, that were published also in a book by Time Out, which you can get hold of here if you uh, use our special link. Um, and, uh, and this tree here is called Barney. It's absolutely beautiful, as you can see. It's extremely famous. Um, it is probably the largest tree in London. 
Uh, they still in existence. Obviously, we talked about the long gone Fairlop oak tree in our last series, but that disappeared in 1820. So, of all the trees that are still existing today, this is by far the largest. And it's a really important tree, a, a tree as well, because it's named, it's called Barney. It's obviously named after Barn Elms Park, which is where we are now. Um, Barn Elms was a, there was a big manor house that actually uh, was just destroyed. Wow, look at those parakeets. This is a plane tree and it currently has a girth of 8.2 meters um, though that girth actually grows by a couple of centimeters every year it dates back to the 1660s although some people say it uh, comes from 1680 um, and it's the very first uh, London plane tree the very very first and it all happened when oriental and American plane trees cross-pollinated for the first time creating what we know today as the London plane which means it is also London's oldest plane tree as, as in the London plane uh, so this massive tree is currently 35.2 meters tall um, and it's growing every year and it's doing very well this has been an interesting episode isn't it lots of history as usual we're, we're an educational channel mm -hmm. um, and there's loads more to show you in the next episode we're going to go to the London Wetlands Centre which Ooh. is just over there Ooh, wetlands uh, wetlands yes it's really exciting and we're going to go and also see lots more interesting houses and pubs and all sorts of stuff so stick with us um, so uh, you know what you want to say till next, next time, time. Bye. bye next time on love your london it's all about the wwc london wetland center there's so much to see there that we thought it deserved an episode on its own so please subscribe so you don't miss it and don't forget to like and share see you shortly bye from acton town to Wimbledon, from brixton to beyond love your london have a banana